dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having departed. You remember this was one of those occasions when our Lord went over the border into Gentile territory, and this woman met him, and in a very uncharacteristic fashion, Christ seemed to ignore her. And the apostles finally called Christ's attention to her because she was very persistent about the matter, and then Christ seemed very reluctant to grant her her requested uh, blessing, and the dialogue which we have just read uh, took uh, place in which uh, he very clearly referred to her as a, a dog. My first observation here is this hard saying of Jesus is that those who are outside the family of faith are dogs not deserving even an offer of God's gospel or healing. Uh, she was outside the sphere of salvation. The church at that time, as you know, was almost exclusively uh, Israel. As Amos had said, you only of all the families of the earth have I known, and Christ made a point of the fact that he came to the lost people of Israel. And he restricted his ministry almost entirely, except for an occasional excursion into Gentile territory such as this, to uh, the Israelites. Now this non-Israelite, this Syrophoenician Gentile woman, uh, makes the petition we have just uh, mentioned and is uh, uh, told that uh, this food, the blessing that she was asking, was for God's people and not for those who were uh, not uh, God's people. And he uses the metaphor of the uh, children's bread not to be thrown to uh, the dogs. Now, the implication here is clearly that the blessing she asked, which would involve the healing of her daughter and the healing of her own soul and so on, she was not entitled to. And it was not Christ's ministry to bring it to her. He was restricted to the house of Israel uh, primarily, and as I say, seldom ventured over into uh, Gentile territory. And in the product process of it, he likens those outside the sphere of redemption to uh, dogs. And the woman's playing on that expression, saying the dog get the crumbs from the table, is what actually turned the tables for her and brought the blessing which she desire. But I'm making this general uh, statement that those outside the family of faith are dogs, that is, they're outcasts. They are not God's children. This term can no way be construed in that particular manner. But what's even more uh, searching is that they're not deserving even an offer of the gospel. The, um, Christ didn't feel any obligation to do what the woman uh, asked. He didn't even take the initiative in the matter. He wasn't preaching to her. He wasn't trying to persuade her. He wasn't becoming all things to all men that he might by all means win some. He was just on a bit of a vacation, and he felt no obligation, expressed no obligation uh, to help uh, this woman and explain the reason for it was that God's concern was with his own children, and only after they were taken care of, and that was his mission, could uh, there be any consideration given to those who were not his children. That was the meaning of Gentiles. It wasn't that they're Gentiles. It's the fact that as Gentiles, they're outside the sphere of Israel or the sphere of uh, the church. Any question on that point? Same procedure as usual. Anybody may raise a question any time, but not more than one uh, question at a time. And help me, if somebody raises his hand, I don't see it, uh, so that I can get around to deal with it. Second, then, this Syrophoenician woman was ignored at first and only finally heard and blessed because she was a Gentile, and as a Gentile did not put her in any particular um, obligation before God. God felt no particular obligation to benefit uh, this woman at all. We know Christ would never act unethically, and Christ would never turn away from a person he had an obligation to turn to. Uh, that's all between uh, uh, the line. And the reason he didn't feel an obligation to her was given here, that she was a Gentile in the sense of a outside the sphere of uh, a redemptive activity. For he said, salvation is of the Jews. Uh, Christ's ministry <laughs> was to the lost sheep of Israel exclusively. For he said, salvation is of the Jews, not even of the half-Jewish Samaritans, John 4, 22. See, that expression, salvation of the Jews, does not occur in the dialogue 
with a Syrophoenician woman, you remember, but with a half-Jew, this woman of uh, Samaria. But even that half-Jew who would be closer to the sphere of redemption than this uh, non-Jew, Gentile, Syrophoenician woman, was uh, not entitled to it either. She'd ask the question, you know, where should we worship, in, Jer in Jerusalem or Gerizim, where the Samaritans do? And he told her very bluntly that the proper place was... Jerusalem. It's, uh, salvation was of the Jews and not even of the Samaritans who were half Jews and so on. Then he told about the time coming when people would worship him in spirit and in truth anywhere and not be geographically restricted. But at that particular time, he's stressing to that half Jew that salvation is of the full uh, Jews and not even of the half, uh, half Jews. Three, so Christ regarded people who were not made Christian children of God through faith as dogs or something below contempt in God's eyes. Now here again, you've got to watch me carefully to see that I'm not reading anything into the expression which is not warranted. He certainly, when he calls a woman a dog and contrasts that with being a child, he certainly is not regarding her as of the household of faith. I don't know how you could construe that as in any way a compliment, but an indication of the fact that she was an outsider and she was not in the sphere of the redemptive activity of God, but was a was far less than that, as indicated by a dog, if we were. What about the faithless Israelite? Well, the question is, what about the faithless Israelite? Would that person uh, not be a dog? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That person would be worse than a dog in the sense of being a hypocrite and the condemnation of people who are in the sphere of redemptive activity who are actually hypocritical is far more repulsive to God than those inside. But what we're talking about here is the sphere of redemptive activity. And uh, the sphere of redemptive activity at that time was the Jewish people. Not all Jews were saved, but when people were saved, they were either Jews or they were later on brought into Judaism as, uh, as uh, proselytes. And uh, the, the fact that the sphere of redemption is in this area doesn't mean that everybody in this area is saved. Now, salvation is of the Jews, as Christ said, that doesn't mean that every Jew is saved. See, there are those in Israel who are not of Israel. You know, they're true Jews, they're true sons of Abraham, and there are other. There's Jacob and there's Esau. Let me repeat that, make sure we all get that. The sphere of redemption means this is the area in which God primarily works, but it doesn't mean that everybody within that sphere, as we, for example, everybody baptized and in the Christian church, is the sphere of God's redemptive activity. But it doesn't mean that everybody here or everybody baptized and in a Christian church somewhere in the sphere of redemption is himself redeemed. But if a person is redeemed who is now outside the church, he will come into the church. And redemption will still be associated with uh, the church itself. that answer your question, uh, Larry? Yes, please. Was not the term dogs generally applied to anybody outside right, the Jewish religion? Right, right, And all I'm saying is that didn't necessarily imply God's contempt by Jesus' using the term. That's a good question. The term dogs was reply, uh, applied not only in this specific instance, but generally to people outside the sphere of, uh, of God's redemptive activity. Then the question comes, does the term, since it's applied to everybody outside that sphere, mean a term of reproach? And I'd say, yes, that does follow for this reason. It doesn't mean they will not be redeemed, as in this instance they, this woman is redeemed, but it does mean that as long as they are outside that sphere, extra ecclesios, ecclesiom non salus est, outside the sphere of salvation, there is no salvation. Persons are all dogs outside that area. Now, they may, as this Syrophoenician woman uh, does, move from out to within, an exception to the rule, not very many, uh, Gentiles at this time are converted. But as long as they remain outside, untouched by the gospel, they are outside salvation. They are lost souls. They are dogs, or whatever the term may actually uh, be. I'd say that's implied in the metaphor. What is uh, not implied is that they are never brought into the sphere. Just as this other question indicated the fact that people in the sphere may not be true Christians, some people who are outside the sphere and as such not uh, Christians at all, nevertheless may come into the sphere. The way Augustine put, put it is that there are some sheep outside the fold and there are some wolves inside 
the fold. That is not inconsistent with the fact that if a per the, the sheep is outside the fold, he's going to be brought into the fold, and that ideally wolves within the fold should, by discipline, be removed. They will never all be removed. There always will be wolves. There always will be tares. There always will be bad fish. There always will be uh, vessels to uh, dishonor in that sphere. This is refining the concept uh, of the church and the that Latin expression, you know, that I referred to there is a, is a historic term developed by the church in the course of the uh, centuries that illustrates the point we are on right now. It's associated with Rome, but Rome has no monopoly on this concept or no legitimacy in claiming it, as a matter of fact. Extra ecclesiam non salus est. The church has always liked to liken the saved to those who are in Noah's ark. All outside are going to be drowned. If you're going to survive the flood of divine wrath and so on, you're going to be in the ark or in the ecclesiom. Now, they're outside the church, you see. Here's a Syrophoenician woman, here's a Gentile woman, here's a modern Jew, for example, who doesn't believe, who's outside the church. That doesn't mean that that person may not be brought inside, but as long as the person is outside, he's lost, he's a dog, he's on his way to ruin, he is not a child entitled to the table, but that doesn't say he has not been elected and will not be brought in, just as the other question has indicated, that not everybody who is in the church is saved. Here's a problem Rome has with this, if I may take a step uh, further here. Uh, Rome had a major uh, controversy of a quarter of a century or so ago with a Father Feeney in the Holy Ghost Order in the Mass in Boston area because he was maintaining that the classic Roman view is that outside the Roman church there is no salvation. And he was orthodox in the Roman way and felt that a great many fellow Roman Catholics were deviating from this term and was appealing for vindication of the orthodoxy of his view, his Roman Catholic view that outside the Roman Catholic church there is no salvation. Now as a Protestant watching that controversy, my sympathies were totally with Father Feeney. He was right about his own church's view, which view is abysmally wrong, but it was nevertheless the Roman view, and the man was suffering in his own tradition. He appealed ultimately to the Pope, and the Pope wouldn't hold him up, I think mainly because of PR purposes, because Rome does not want to be recognized today as championing the classic uh, formula that outside Ecclesiam Romam, outside of the Roman church, there is no salvation. Now, we don't restrict it to that, but we do restrict it to the true church. Outside the true church, there is no salvation. At that time, that Christ was dealing with, the Jewish church and the true church were one and the same as far as the external bounds were concerned. Not everybody in Israel was an Israelite, indeed, without guile and so on. But if anybody did come to salvation, he moved from this sphere into this sphere. But as long as you're outside with a Syrophoenician woman or any other person, that person is uh, not a child of God, negatively speaking. He's under the judgment of God, and here in the metaphor is called a, a dog. So Christ, number three, uh, regarded people who were not made children of God through faith as dogs or something below contempt in God's eyes. There again, that language is feeble on my part. God is furious with the wicked. He's angry with the wicked every day. The wrath of God abides on people. So if any of you have any trouble with my using the language below contempt or beneath contempt, realize, as I say, this is a massive understatement on my part. Four, they were not acceptable to God or entitled to the gospel offer. Get that. Not entitled even to the gospel offer until it was taken to the nominal people of God first. So those outside the covenant generally were outside the spiritual concern of God according to Jesus Christ. There again is another hard saying but it's nevertheless a clear saying in the Bible. Remember how Paul in Acts sermon mentions that God winked at the sins of the Gentile in the past. He let them go their own way, and their own way led to ruin. There were only the people in Israel whom he was vouchsafing redemption, except, as I say, Jonah goes to the Gentile, to the Ninevites, and a few exceptions like that. And Jesus is working under that same uh, basic... Uh, uh, structure. Now, uh, when we say here that people outside this sphere are not only not children of God, they don't even have a right to the offer of the gospel. And growing right out of this passage, it reminds us once again 
that the gospel is a matter of pure grace. Nobody could ever be entitled to grace. If you think you deserve grace, you're not talking about grace. Grace, by definition, is not only in and of itself undeserved, even the offer of it is undeserved. You may know friends who are perishing, and you ought to be exercised about them and doing what you can for them and so on, as we'll notice before this is all over, but at the same time, you should never let them get away with the notion that they are entitled to the gospel. You, I hope we'll show before this lecture is over, are obligated to offer the gospel to them, but that doesn't carry the implication that they are entitled to it. You get the difference, don't you? God may have commanded you to become all things to all men that you might by all means win some. That doesn't mean that they deserve even your offer of the gospel. It doesn't excuse you from not offering it, but it doesn't excuse them from thinking they have it coming to them. And they must watch especially the subtlety of supposing, well, if he gave it to you, he owes it to me. Nonsense. He owes nothing. Grace can't be owed. Grace is a pure gift. And obviously, if he gives you something you deserve, your neighbor can't say he deserves it too. You've got to watch this type of uh, thing. This is one of the values of this particular hard saying, I think. Number five. Christ, who is the truth, spoke only the truth. Therefore, those who believe Christ must believe as Christ believed. Since Christ believed that those who are not children of uh, the church are dogs, Christians must believe the same. That seems to go without saying, doesn't it? It doesn't go without uh, actual disregard of it and so on. But nevertheless, uh, if Jesus says this, then we ask ourselves, ourselves uh, do we agree with that? And if we don't agree with that, then we make it perfectly clear that we don't agree with uh, Jesus. And we know if we don't agree with Jesus that uh, we just are not Jesus' disciples. Yes, sir. Well, if Jesus didn't, re didn't recognize her as being one of his, he recognizes his own sheep. Who brought this lady salvation? Who, who brought conversion at that point in time? Or did he extend it at that point in time? The question... Yeah. The question comes, uh, if Christ did not regard this woman as one of his, uh, how did she come to receive uh, this blessing? You see, as a Syrophoenician woman, an unbeliever, a Gentile, she was not one of Christ. Now, of course, she t uh, probably was elect and uh, chosen as a Gentile who, like uh, Rahab and other uh, Ruth, the mother of um, our Lord, you know, and so on, were Gentiles who later, who were elect and were later brought into the Israelitish community. But as long as the woman was uh, uh, outside the fold in a Gentile unbelief, she was not uh, his, and he was telling her that. Now, we know from this episode of the healing of the woman's daughter, probably her own healing, that she was elect and that she was destined to come into this particular group. And when you ask the question, how does he know, or how does Christ know? Christ, uh, uh, of course, as de deity, he would know. But as a mere man, he wouldn't know any more than you or I would know when we're dealing with somebody who's outside the Christian fold at the present time. But we would say to a person outside the Christian fold at the present time, you are outside the sphere of divine grace. You cannot be saved except by the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a fact. You are a dog. You are under the wrath of God. You are not his child. You ought not to think of yourself as such. We don't know when we talk to that person whether that individual is going to be brought into the people of God. We'll find out. And sometimes we've had the joy of seeing someone who was at the time a dog becoming a sheep of Christ through our uh, ministry. But let me repeat once again here. The person outside the sphere, not making a profession of faith at all, is not a child of God, is not even entitled to the grace of God, which is a mere gift and so on, but, apropos your question, may be elect and may be brought into this act. And if you press the question, how do you know whether the person is or not, you don't know in advance. You'll only tell by the subsequent history of that person as he or she embraces or rejects your or other people's offer of, uh, of the gospel. Number six, Christ's missionary message to make disciples of all nations came only after the children rejected the bread Jesus brought them. I think you know what I mean there. He came to his own, the Israelites, the church of his time, 
and his own received him not. And when they received him not, ultimately, and the day of visitation had come, and he turned away from them and assigned them to judgment, and the wiping out of the Israelitish nation as the household of faith, which occurred principally at the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, that is the time when the children, having rejected the bread, here is a dog who accepts the bread, but the children as a whole, ultimately, are going to reject the bread and become dogs. The dogs become children, and the, and the children become dogs, all of the, uh, because the dog accepts the gospel and the child so-called, outwardly, nominally, uh, rejects it. But that, historically, doesn't take place until a later moment. Right now, Christ is carrying out his earthly ministry, and it's only as the Israelites reject their proper king, and he rejects them and delivers them over to judgment, Matthew 23, and so on, does he commission his apostles and his church today, go you into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The reason you and I are here this morning, all of it, which are most of us being non-Jews, is precisely this historical shift from the moment we uh, were dealing with here to the moment in which we are now. But it doesn't change anything. The only difference is that the ecclesiom of the Old Testament was restricted to a national ethnic entity, the Jews. Now it belongs to the whole world and not to any one ethnic entity. Gentile is not a specific group of mankind. It's an, a non-Jew. And the non-Jew is the sphere of Christ's redemptive, but not Gentile world as such, but those who are called out of the Gentile world into the ecclesia, into the church itself. They are the ones, and they are the ones who sit at Christ's table and are fed by Jesus Christ and all others, Jews or Gentiles, who do not believe are dogs on the outside and everything that Christ is saying about this dog applies to the dogs today. You get that point here. There's a change in the composition of the church, but no change in the basic nature of the church and those outside the church. The ecclesia now is in all the whole world, the ecclesia at the day of Christ was just restricted to a tiny group of people uh, called the uh, Israelites. But the principle remains the same. That's the reason this whole passage has a great deal of bearing on our missionary effort uh, today. Number seven, when some of the Gentiles were discipled and became part of the church, which is now mostly Gentile with a minority of Jews, as before it was mostly Jewish with a minority of Gentiles, Christ's position remained unchanged. That is, the bread of the gospel still belongs to the children of the church and those outside, Gentiles and Jews, unbelieving Gentiles and Jews, are dogs, not entitled to the gospel message and blessing until the church first be fed. Now, here's a point where this has a direct bearing on the missionary uh, effort. A missionary effort is necessarily an outreach of the Christian church. This particular congregation is noted for its emphasis on that. As I like to remind us, we are meeting here in this very improper place for a Sunday school lecture and so on because this church gave some large number of money to Guatemala a couple years ago rather than building a, an addition to their, their church. It's, it's an evidence of the fact that this particular congregation, I trust every Christian congregation, recognizes an evangelistic uh, uh, effort. But the point here is this. This church, every evangelical church, has to establish itself first. It has to feed its own people. It can't be a true church without being fed, and it can't feed others unless it's first of all nurtured. And as long as that's the case, it's the people who are uh, the beneficiaries of the table of Christ and the bread of Christ, and the world outside will have to wait. And the world outside are dogs, and strictly speaking, they are not even entitled to the bread offer, as it uh, were. But obviously, if we're under a mandate to evangelize the world, we ought to get our own house in order. We ought to build the people up so that they can reach out from a strong position to bring others to this same, uh, the same table. Number eight, so we Gentile believers, if we would follow Jesus, must view those outside the church, our church, as still 
to be dogs. Which, as I say, as a compliment to them, I apologize always to the dogs. I'm very fond of dogs, and dogs are a very innocent uh, breed of uh, creature, you know. And so, but this is just a way of indicating that a man is less than a man. And he's, uh, they pick on dogs and serpents and other <laughs> creatures to liken us to worms. And worms is a favorite metaphor of Jonathan Edwards. I suffer every time for those poor worms who, who are sort of uh, demoralized by being compared with wicked uh, human beings. Animals don't sin. We're the only ones who can sin, and so on. So as I say, it's rather rough on the animals to compare us uh, to them. But the meaning is plain. The metaphor is so vivid that you realize that we who are so prone to think of ourselves as the choice children of God... So far from the children of God, we are beneath the animals who are beneath uh, us. This does, number nine, this does not mean that we deny them their rights as human beings. In fact, we must love our enemies, dogs, worms, whatever. We must love them. But we cannot recognize them as the children of God in the sense of being in the redeemed family or even having a right to the offer of salvation. I repeat once again, you have an obligation to give them the offer, okay? That doesn't mean they have a right to receive the offer, okay? Shame on you if you don't. Shame on you if you give the impression that they have it coming to them, you see. But you must, but you must not uh, suppose that this is uh, of their deserving. As soon as you start deserving the gospel, you're talking about something other than the gospel. That must never actually be forgotten any more than the idea that people outside the sphere of it are lost uh, souls who, by compliment, are referred to as dogs. Ten, they are to be sure the creatures of God, but they are morally and spiritually lower than the dumb animals because, as sinners, they have become the children of the devil, as we will see to be true in another hard saying of Jesus. It comes along uh, later on. This is, a, as I say, this is a mild term of reproach. When Christ talks more literally, he will call the unbelievers the children of the devil. And that is not a figure of speech. Number 11. Moreover, in spite of these dogs' high estimate of themselves, as by nature children of God, we cannot agree. We must insist, whatever language we use, that they are not God's children. They cannot become God's children until they first admit that they are not naturally God's children. In fact, until they admit that they are dogs, as did this woman, they can never become God's children. The things that distressed me so much last year when I was over here, the way you people are going crazy about Gandhi. There are people, you know, who think Gandhi is a greater man than, than, uh, than Jesus Christ. It doesn't amaze me about this world, but I found Christian people who actually think Gandhi was a Christian of the extraordinary order. Gandhi was a dog. Gandhi was a lost soul. Gandhi rejected Jesus Christ. How dare you think such things as that? Oh, you can very well argue that his cause for India and his method of resisting England may have been good and wise and accomplished but very well. But don't forget he's a dog. Don't forget that anybody outside of Christ is a dog. If, you are, if you're going to forget that, you're forgetting what uh, Christianity really means. Let me remind you once again this phrase, fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man was a term of Harnock, the famous historian, in his book, The Essence of Christianity, written at the turn of the century. That's what he found Jesus of Nazareth teaching, that God is the father of all men, and men are the brothers of each other. Now, obviously, he was skipping this episode and just about every other episode that has to do with any other hard saying. Obviously, this woman was not a child of God. Obviously, God was not this woman's father. How the heck can you make anything any plainer than that? And yet, the church has... Uh, been corrupted extensively on the notion that this is actually the, this is what Harnock considered the essence of the Christian religion. That's what he called the book. That's Ves and Des Christentums, translated as the essence of, this is the essence of Christianity. It's a diabolical fraud. God is not the father of men except through Jesus Christ. They're not his children, they're dogs. And as far as brothers are concerned, they're not in the communion of saints. There is a sense in which it's true. God is the father of all spirits. He's the creator of all human beings. We have a common father, be we black or white or yellow or red, be we Americans, Russians or whatever, be we male or female, be we learned or unlearned, be we rich or poor. We have one creator, but we can't call him our father. As I say in a later hard saying, we're going to find that outside of Christ, the devil is our father. And while we are all made of one blood, 
and that ought never to be forgotten. We are not brothers in the household of faith, and that must never be forgotten. Here's the razor's edge once again, to do justice to the way in which that is true, so that there is no unfair discrimination because of color, sex, greed, or anything like that, and at the same time recognize a sense in which that is false, so that it's absolutely diabolical and ensures the damnation of souls because you already make them think they are the children of Christ and have God as their father and so on is something we have to watch very carefully. I think it's part of the reason. Edwards can speculate on the fact that one of the reasons for these hard sayings is that it makes people think and scrutinize more carefully. Another reason I think here is that it makes us recognize in unmistakable, graphic, and in somewhat awesome terms, the truths of these realities. It's easy enough to say that, you know, I'm a sophisticated professor myself. I can talk in a low voice at times, and I can use 10-inch words and things like that, too, on occasion. But nevertheless, in the last analysis, when you want to get it known, what you're saying about people, it gets to call them dogs. Just recognize they're serpents. Just mention them as devil as their father, and so on. I think Christ, gra Christ was a, uh, not a seminary professor. He was not a lecturer. He spoke to the masses. And he wanted to get over, and he got over. And these sayings cannot uh, easily be forgotten, and that's one of the great joys of them. You can't call a woman simply because she's a Gentile, a dog. And anybody really uh, actually forget that. And then you have to ask yourself, what's the meaning of that? And so on. We've given some of the uh, meaning of it so far. Number 12, by implication, if we give dogs the impression that they are children, that is a sure way to keep them dogs. If we preach the gospel of self-esteem, that is not another gospel, and an apostolic anathema awaits us, it will make the dogs think more highly of themselves than they ought to think, and that is fatal, for only the poor in spirit inherit the kingdom of God. I cannot stress that too much, my dear friend. If you don't recognize people outside the gospel are dogs, that's the best way to keep them that way. They are never going to be anything other than dogs as long as you go around. You have the gospel of redeeming them from doghood to childhood, and so on, are giving them the impression they're children when they're dogs. Don't say you love them. Don't add that hypocrisy to your crimes. Number t uh, 13. So evangelism is utterly false, which ignores this unpleasant truth. Human dogs are so prone to vanity that if we do not make very clear to them their lost condition by nature, they will naturally assume that God would be fortunate to have them in his church at his table. And I don't think there's any question a great deal of evangelism goes on in that way. You're a nice person, and we've got a group of very nice people in our church, and we need people like you, and you'd be right at home with people like us, and so on. And God even has a plan, and this, that, and the other sort of thing. You'll tell those people as a good way, according to Dale Carnegie and other people, to ingratiate yourself with them and to get them to sign on the dotted line and to join your happy little club and so on. It's a very effective method for doing it. But it's a method of darkness and not of light. And you're not promoting what you're professing to, uh, to promote. Fourteen, Christ here calls unbelievers dogs, but elsewhere they referred to him as swine, by him as swine and serpents, and other equivalent, if less vivid synonyms for sinners, lest we should think Christ is not to be taken seriously because he is not to be taken literally. They were shook up by the statement that Christ calls a, calls a human being a dog. How did Christ do a thing like that, you see? Well, Christ repeats metaphors even worse than that, so you understand perfectly well he knows what he's saying. He's not doing this for effect. This isn't just a homiletic device for stimulating attention. As I say, it does stimulate attention, and it becomes unforgettable. But though he doesn't mean it literally, she's not a canine running around on four, all four, he means very profoundly, that she is outside. She is not a child of God. And this is a pernicious heresy to call to her as such, as is done by everybody in the world, and so on. As this phrase is used by Harnock, it means that Christ regarded everybody as having God as his father and everybody having everybody else as his brother. Now, that is, of course, not compatible with a concept such as we have here in Christ. Number 15 Taking Christ's hard saying seriously should do something to our bumper stickers. Not that we should print signs saying, all non-Christians are dogs, which would be absolutely true, of course. But the unqualified, God loves you, 
is at least misleading. The average person reading that sign probably thinks he is not as bad as he knows he is because, after all, God loves him. If you can modify that bumper plate to signify that God deals kindly with people whom he utterly detests, that would communicate the truth, at once humbling a person and giving him some room for hope. If he asks about that hope, you should be ready to assure him that as soon as he admits he is a dog, Christ may let him have some crumbs from the gospel table. As long as he is offended at being called a dog, he proves that he is one. Now, see, you all laugh when I mention that uh, sticker, all non-Christians are dogs. Uh, you, know, you laugh, I would laugh too if I were sitting where you were and listening to somebody saying what I would say, and so on. I don't, I don't go in for stickers anyway, but I can see myself getting a sticker such as that. But that's far, far truer. Far, far truer than the sticker you use all the time without even thinking about it. Now, of course, the reason you ought not to use it, it's not so much that it would shock people as that they would get the wrong idea. They would think you're holier than they, you're acting superior to them, you're in the in group and they're in the out group, and you, God, without any reason, whatever, rejects you out of hand, and you, on the other hand, are the teacher's favorites, and such things, pets, and all that type of thing. Get all the wrong ideas. If somehow or other you could convey to them that God is infinitely angry with the wicked every moment, but at the same time his full wrath has not come upon them, now is the day of salvation. If they seek the Lord, they may be found, and so on. That is highly desirable. Now, the way you go about it, you'll have to work out. I'm not in the business of making slogans for plates and things like that. That's your job. That's one of the interesting things we found out in our discussions here, you see. Especially last week, we got into the casuistry, or the precise way, and I guess that was the Philippians, but of working out the principles. We get the principles. That's all a minister can teach. That's all the Bible teaches. The principle is here. All men outside of Christ are on the judgment of God. They are not entitled to the gospel or even the offer of the gospel. There's the principle. Another principle we have from another source is that we are to become all things to all men that we might by all means win some. Now, when it comes to working out in slogans for your car or speeches at the door or work for your evangelism committee or something like that, precisely the best way to go about carrying out that command, that's for you to work out. And that's quite difficult often. And you have to do a good deal of jockeying. And maybe you have to bend a little bit one way or another and such things as that. But the mandate's clear. These people are lost. And you mustn't give them any other pr impression. You, on the other hand, have a word of salvation they don't deserve. And you can do everything in your power to reach them with it. And so on. How you work it out, you work it out. And if all Christians or dogs can help, by all means get slogans like that. If God loves you can really be interpreted correctly, then keep that slogan. Otherwise, pull it off your car. I'll ask you for a moment. I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds to reply, and if you don't answer in 30 seconds, I'll know you don't want to comment, which is all right. But let me ask you this question. Am I not right when I say that most people, people, John Doe, walking down the street, seeing your slogan in the back of your car, and so on, non-Christian now, just John Doe, no professor, and so on, sees that car saying to him, God loves you, am I or am I not right in saying that 98%, 99% probably, of the John Doe's who see that would conclude from that statement that you advertise that they are acceptable to God. That whatever they're doing, whatever they're living, however displeasing it may be to God, they themselves are loved by God and basically are acceptable to God. Am I wrong in that? I'm not wrong. Apparently I'm not wrong. 20 seconds, 10 seconds coming up. Well, you want to settle for nods of heads. Apparently I'm not wrong on that. And if I'm not wrong, then you're wrong. And you are falsely advertising the gospel. And while the solution may not be all non-Christians are dogs, you better find a solution for it and you better get the truth over uh, two uh, people. Number 16, worse than that, as long as you are offended at recognizing yourself in your natural state, as well as your non-Christian friend, as a dog, you too must be a dog. Here comes the searching now. You really recoil at this? And not just because of your neighbor, but because of yourself? Well, I never thought of myself as a dog. I always felt I'm a pretty decent... Oh, I'm not perfect! No! But not a dog! 
and me. I mean, let's ask ourselves very bluntly now in the privacy of our own souls here, are you offended at recognizing yourself in your natural state? Remember, we were all women of Syrophoenicia at one time. We were all outside the fold. We were all under the wrath of God. We never became children of God without, first of all, recognizing ourselves to be children of the devil, dogs, and so on. Are you offended at recognizing yourself in your natural state as well as your non-Christian friend, a dog? You too must be a dog. Christ's dog, after all, is a person like this Syrophoenician woman who was outside the sphere of saving grace. What do you suppose you were before you came into grace? Do you think you were not a dog? If you do, that proves that you not only were a dog, but alas and sadder still, are yet a dog. Okay? Number 17. The modern church is largely a dog pound rather than a sheep fold. Most ministers today don't even believe Christ at this point. Bernard Shaw said that this Syrophoenician episode was the time that Christ was not a Christian. Christ's ministers should know better, but they don't seem to. Many of them would call me worse names than dog right now simply because I insist on believing the Christ they also profess to believe. To be a Christian minister, is no, it is no longer necessary to believe Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, that is a good way to be barred from ordination in some places. Most church agencies in the world today would not think of ordaining a man or even a woman who believed a quarter of the hard sayings of Jesus Christ. Is that a hard saying of John Gerstner there? Is that too rough? I think it's true as far as mainline denominations are concerned. And it is not our, our denomination, no exception to it, and we're not the universal rule either. This is a general a general problem. And I've seen it happen in time in cases I could mention the, the rest of the, of the time here that it's a downright precarious thing to become a minister of Jesus Christ if you really believe the things that Jesus Christ taught and commit yourself to teaching them. We mentioned two weeks ago, you remember the theological principle, that nobody can respond to the gospel invitation unless God enables them by regeneration. As I said at that time, 90% of the evangelists are up in arms at such a proposition as that. They wouldn't think of making me a minister in a church which is absolutely committed to the proposition that it's within the power of every individual, as he is, dog that he may be, of himself to initiate faith and come running to Jesus Christ as a Savior. And yet Jesus Christ says that very, very uh, plainly. You know, it becomes a hazard to be a Christian in a Christian church in a decadent uh, time. Of course, again, I remind you, we have no monopoly on that. The days of Jesus... The church was more corrupt than she is now. Let me go back to that once again since we were talking about this contrast between the dogs outside and the people or children. A sheep is another metaphor. Here it's children, remember, at the table. But the children inside were mostly not children. He came to his own, his children, and his children received him not. And children, by definition, of course, say, Daddy. They don't would call him as, as, as someone they don't know and so on. So... Uh, and those outside, some of them were, as has one question brought out, elect and themselves brought in to be real children. But this is no new thing. That is, you have many children who aren't children. Thank God there are some outside who are dogs who aren't dogs to be, ultimately. These dogs are destined to become real children just as these children are destined to be shown to be real dogs in the day of judgment, though probably not uh, before that. Question? Within our denomination, who seeks ordination, does he have to deny a lot of the gospel in order to become a... The question here is, does uh, the average candidate for ordination in the, our denomination, which I say for the video audience is the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, has to deny a great deal of the Christian faith to be uh, ordained as a minister? I would say the answer to that on the surface is no, mainly because the questions are very superficial. If the, uh, if the examination is very thorough... Yes, you will have to. The, um, but for the most part, our questions are very superficial because, you see, our creed is so orthodox. And this is true of, a, I'm talking about the Presbyterian Church now, but it applies to the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, the Baptist Church, every other church as well. But I, I'm a Presbyterian. I'm talking about Presbyterians right now. Our creed, the Westminster Confession of Faith, a very orthodox creed. And they profess in some way or another to accept it. Now, people who don't even know what it is and have never read it will say that. And presbyteries, which examine people, are frequently so careless that they don't find out whether the person really believes it or not. 
Now, if they really found out if this person is known as a conservative and they suspect he does believe it, then you'll get a very scrutinizing examination sometime. And if he's not suspected, then, of course, they may not examine him. And usually when people are heretical, they don't stand up under analysis, so analysis is not given to them. It gets a little bit complicated, but to put it this way, the um, most of the mainline denominations, not unfortunately accepting our own, are extremely careless at the present time about the receiving of persons. Insofar as there is any excitation on the matter, it is to see to it that where anybody is suspected of really believing this creed, he's very thoroughly scrutinized. And so and I'll give you one personal illustration back in a healthier day than the present day. Uh, in, in the old United Presbyterian Church of North America, out of which this congregation was born, and so on, a man from a southern Presbyterian, I will leave names out, but I'll be very specific either way, a man from a southern Presbyterian church was being called to our most prominent Presbyterian pulpit in Pittsburgh. This man was a very orthodox man, and these people who were in charge were very desirous of preventing him coming to this pulpit. So on the examining committee... They deliberately put a man named John Gerstner because they knew that John Gerstner would examine a person very thoroughly. And they hoped that because they didn't want this man there, that Gerstner's examination would somehow or other prove him incompetent to be in that. Well, as a matter of fact, Gerstner's examination proved that man to be thoroughly orthodox and the wicked were caught in their own traps. He was actually vindicated by a person whom they thought he might expose. They were only interested in keeping him, keeping him out. But had they known he was really orthodox in a thorough sense of the word that would stand up under scrutiny, they would have done everything in their power to figure out some way to make his orthodoxy look unorthodox. And that would never be involved using me and so on. But that's the way this type of thing works out. All I can say in a general statement is we have all the major denominations have deflected so much from what their creed professes that for the most part they give slapdash type of examination and the sympathy is with those who deviate rather than those who uh, uh, cleave uh, to it. But let me remind you, once again, that's no different from what it was in the days of Jesus. And as a matter of fact, our situation, mind you, is improved. We're not as indecadent at the present time as they were when Jesus had this particular encounter. In those days, uh, his children, Israel, were mostly all bastards. Hardly any of them were believers. All of the apostles were Jews, but it was only a minority and the Jewish people as a whole from that day to this have been rejected as God's people are called as an ethnic group. Now they are invited just as anybody else is, and thank God some of them do believe the gospel. Number 18, this woman's conversion turned on her recognizing that she was a dog. The average person would have been mortally offended at such language. Her ethnic pride could easily have been aroused. Undoubtedly, Gentiles had some coarse terms for Jews, <coughs> which may have sprung into her mind and could easily have taken possession of it. Ethnic slurs are an international phenomenon. This woman could easily have entered this fray, but she was interested in truth, and she believed Christ. Somehow she knew that this Jew was a man of God, and she knew that a man of God, be he Jew or whatever, spoke the truth. If this man of God called her a dog, she was a dog. Her natural self-esteem notwithstanding. You see, that's what marks the true uh, believer, the person who has a genuine self-estimate. He will accept the verdict of God. And somehow or other, we don't know how, this woman knew, probably from reputation, that this Jesus was the true Jewish Messiah. There were people outside that uh, fold, you know, who had heard about the Messiah, and some of them even sensed that Israel was the people among whom God worked. And somehow or other, I guess when she saw Jesus, she knew he was the real article. And consequently, if you or I had called her a dog, she had probably been ready with some other epithets of her own, and so on. In this particular case, it was different. This man was the real article. This man spoke the truth. It hurt, but there was no doubt in her mind that it was the truth, and she accepted it. There was no returning slur or anything like that. There was no exchange of epithets. She just sensed that Jesus wasn't trying to insult her. He was telling the blunt truth about her, and obviously I think she realized 
not to make her feel bad, but actually to do her good. But as I say, these slurs are an international phenomenon. These Zuni Indians down here in Arizona and southwest part of the country, just a tiny Indian tribe and so on. But I learned in a course in uh, anthropology years ago at Harvard, the Zuni Indians consider all the rest of the world half-baked people. See? That's uh, the Jews considered uh, everybody else dogs, and the, the uh, Greeks considered everybody else barbarians, and so on. It's just that sort of thing. We notice that uh, presidential candidates getting in trouble on that type of thing, people being expelled from the Senate and from the uh, uh, cabinet offices and so on for expressions like that. It's a universal phenomenon. But in this particular case, this woman realized, because of the one who said it, that she was what he was calling her. And so far from exchanging the epithet, she accepted it. Number 19. Precisely because she recognized herself to be a dog, she became all the more desperate for the blessing. If Christ had flattered her, she may have become sure of herself. His insulting, I wish you'd put quotes around that, insulting. He doesn't really insult her. <coughs> it just looks that way. His insulting her by telling her the truth humbled her, and she begged all the more pleadingly. Beggars can't be choosers. They can only be beggars, and dogs are professional beggars. The only way they ever get anything they want is by begging for it. They can't earn it. They can't deserve it. They can't work for it. They just can't get it by themselves. All they can do is beg, and that is all this dog did. She begged. That's one reason I like this metaphor of a dog. When we come to Christ, this is the way we come. Begging for mercy, that's all. No pleas. That dog fits perfectly. As I say, we've always had a dog. It's about the first time we've been together for a year in our lives without a dog, and so on. But uh, a dog, boy, can they plead. And can they twist your arm? And can they wring your heart? And so on. But that's the one thing they can do. Beg, beg, beg. And that's the one thing you're going to do if you're going to have Jesus Christ. Well, that dog, that's a perfect figure. After you become one of Christ, the sheep will do. But before you become a Christian, a dog is probably the best figure of the expression. Number 20, the only way you will ever get anything from God is by recognizing you are a dog and start begging. If you are above being a dog and begging, you can be above a dog and begging but you will not get a blessing from God. Just as I am without one plea, another Gentile, man this time, said he was not fit to have Christ come into his house. A dog of a tax collector begged God just to be merciful. A dying dog begged, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I didn't come to call the righteous, Jesus said, but sinners, that is, dogs. If you are capable of being insulted by the truth about yourself, you are unfit for the kingdom. Finally, so here is another hard saying of Jesus. Are you aware of it? Or did you come thinking that church is the place for decent folk like yourselves? And certainly not for dogs. Is this saying too hard for you? If so, you'll never get even the crumb. As one man once said, this is no religion for a gentleman. He was right. It is a religion for dogs only. No wonder Gilbert Chesterton once said that most Christians don't know what Christianity is, and if they ever find out, they'll realize they don't like it. I've quoted that ad nauseum to you because it is a favorite statement of mine. The ironical thing is, something I have never mentioned when I've cited that Chestertonian statement there, is that that man apparently never realized the truth of his own off-quoted statement. He seems to have died not ever realizing what true Christianity is, but he certainly said a mouthful when he remarked that most people in the Christian church don't know what Christianity is, and if they ever discover it, they'll realize they don't like it. They don't like to be called dogs or thought of as dogs. And if that's the price of admission, no thanks. If some people ever discover you have to be a dog to be a true Christian, goodbye. They have had it. It is not the Jesus they believe in. Their Jesus came to call the righteous together apart from the dogs outside. Who could imagine Jesus would admit the dogs and bar the righteous? Not I. I can't believe it. Goodbye, Jesus of the hard sayings. Goodbye, Jesus of history. Goodbye, Jesus, Savior of sinners only. Give me the Jesus of the good and the righteous and the worthwhile. Give me the Jesus who recognizes a worthy follower when he sees one. Just as I am without one sin to confess, mistakes may be, and certainly not, that I am a dog. But fellow dogs, I salute you. And I certainly say to any of you who think that you are
children, when you are dogs, the only way to become a child is to recognize you are a dog. And may I use my last minute just to remind you, this whole hard saying of Jesus ought to become very precious to our hearts. If we ever have the tendency to forget the pit from which we were dug, the status from which we were rescued, just a reminder that we were all dogs under the wrath of God and less than human beings and not fit for the divine presence, the realization of that is what indicated we were no longer a dog. We're actually a child of God. And being elevated from a place beneath divine contempt and exposed only to divine wrath, we are called his children. We are seated at his table. We got the crumbs at first, but now we sit at his table and we can call him who once called us dogs. Father, have a father. I congratulate you, my dear dog sheep. <laughs> Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy son Jesus. We thank thee for his way of teaching. We thank thee for his hard sayings. We thank thee for the way they break down any pride in us and at the same time bring us to him which gives us a joy unspeakable and full of glory. As we leave this place today, we thank thee that he has sent us into the world to save the dogs of the world to have a genuine concern for them, and as he did with this woman, to bring blessing to them. Help us, therefore, to make them aware that they need Christ because they are guilty sinners, but that Jesus Christ will recognize and save them as soon as they recognize themselves to be undeserving of it. And help us also ourselves, even as we endeavor to win others to Christ's fold, to remember what we once were outside of it, and to rejoice with him thankfully forever that he has transformed us out of the kingdom of darkness and dogs into the kingdom of light and his dear son. In his name we pray, amen.